Hello. Hi. Happy New Year, everybody. My name is Justin, the pastor here at Aletheia. Wonderful to see you all on this beautiful Sunday morning, first Sunday of the year. This is an amazing Sunday to be in church for a couple of reasons. It's Baptism Sunday, a time where people are going to publicly celebrate their faith in Jesus. We're also kicking off a brand new series called Great Faith. And we're doing this in conjunction with our week of prayer and fasting. Now, I know that Taylor gave you great inspiration and gave you the details. I want to underscore, bold, underline, italicize this week of prayer and fasting. This is a way that we as a church every year put God first. Where when it comes to everything we do, both in our lives personally as well as corporately, we come and rather than organizing things around our plans and our, and our goals, we come and we seek God and His purposes and His presence first and foremost. And I want you to be able to do that in your life as well. Before you jump into the busyness of the semester or into the busyness of your plans and your goals, to be able to come and to get refreshed in God's presence and to ask Him to lead and guide you this year. So every single night right here in this room, six to seven Join us, and if you can't make all of them, just pick, you know, one or two or three or four. Say, I'm going to go to that. So we'll see you this coming week. Now, for the next month, we're going to be talking about this topic, faith. Now, I know faith is like a super Bible word. It's it's a very, very Christian Bible-y word, and we don't immediately get super excited about talking about or doing a theological survey of the word faith. But faith is incredibly important when it comes to following Jesus. You cannot follow Jesus without faith. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next three or four weeks in Hebrews 10 and 11. And we are, Hebrews 10 and 11 is, all, is packed full of stories of followers of Jesus living out faith, putting faith into practice. So don't worry, this is not just going to be a theological survey. This is going to be talking about the ways that faith affects life. So join me in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32. Hebrews 10, 32. We're going to read through verse 39. We will have the scripture up here on the screen, so you're welcome to follow along there, or if you're you're using a Bible app, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, okay? So I'm going to read, and then we're going to pray. And we're going to dive into this topic of faith. Hebrews 10, verse 32. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This is God's Word. Join me and let's pray and ask Him to lead and guide us in it. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the start of a new year. God, we pray that this year, as we seek You through prayer and fasting, and as we dive into the topic of faith, would You renew our strength. God, Your Scriptures say that those who wait upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. So we're trusting your scriptures, and we are seeking you first and foremost this year. God, today would you lead and guide us in your scriptures, and may we see what it looks like to have great faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What makes you want to quit? What makes you want to quit following Jesus? I was going to give you an example of what it is for me about the gym and how hard parking is at the beginning of the year because it's the New Year's resolution crowd. But if you'll indulge me, I'm going to get a little more personal because I came face to face yesterday with the thing that makes me want to quit. Yesterday, my daughter, for the second time in in a couple months, had some type of seizure. And we had to 
spend the majority of the day in the emergency room trying to figure out what's going on with her. And as we're sitting there, I was texting numerous people, you know, people in my group, uh, my, my pastor and my boss at Aletheia up in Boston, and through numerous phone calls and just prayer and seeking God, I, it became clear that this wasn't simply uh, a normal sickness, but this had spiritual forces of evil behind it. Now, I know maybe you're in here just checking Christianity out, and that might freak you out, but the Scriptures tell us that when you endeavor to follow Jesus, the Apostle Paul says you will wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil. And that's what it felt like. And man, when spiritual forces of evil mess with my family, that's what makes me want to quit. I hate it. I'm the only one in my house right now that's healthy. And it drives me nuts. It drives me crazy. It makes me want to quit. You will have things, circumstances in your life, and great challenges that you come up against that will make you want to quit. And here's the thing. You can quit and still put on the facade that you're in the game. You can quit really going after Jesus and still sit in a seat on a Sunday morning. You can quit putting Him first and still give off the vibe and still pretend in front of all your friends that you're still in the game. You you can do that. But my desire for me, as well as for you, is that year after year after year after year, the nature of following Jesus would be that we are on fire for Jesus, that we're passionate about it, that we're not shaken by circumstances going into it. So the question is, what is going to give us great faith? What is going to give us great faith in the midst of challenges? And here's my, here's my point. If you don't remember anything else, please remember this. We need great faith to face great challenges. We need great faith because great challenges are coming down the pipeline. Maybe they're here in your life right now, or maybe they're a month from now, or maybe they're a couple years, but there are going to be things that make you want to quit. And in order to face them and endure through them, you are going to need great faith. Now, the people that we just read about, that this author is writing to, they're facing that kind of thing. There was a time where they had great faith and it gave them endurance, but for whatever reason, their confidence has been shaken. And they're not feeling as gung-ho about following Jesus. Their boldness has waned. Their, their, Their passion for Jesus has diminished And the author of Hebrews is writing to them, and he's wanting to tell them what it looks like to recapture great faith. And he's going to answer two questions for us when it comes to to this great faith that we need to face great challenges. He's going to answer the question, how does great faith empower us to face great challenges? So the how, what is it about great faith that gives us what we need in facing these great challenges? And secondly, how do we strengthen our faith? When challenges shake our confidence. So to that first question, how does great faith empower us to face great challenges? Look at where the author starts. He casts their memory back to a time in which great faith was at work and on fire. He says, recall the former days. Now here's what was going on in these former days. They were, so this was after they were enlightened, which means this is after they heard the message of the gospel the good news about Jesus Christ, and they believed in it, after they heard that and believed in it, they endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to, repro- to, to reproach and affliction. So get that. In some way, shape, or form, they were brought up in plain view of everybody else, and for following Jesus, they were ridiculed and mocked in front of other people. Sometimes it was them, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. But look at how they encountered this challenge. What was going on inside of them? You had compassion on those in prison. Now, when you hear prison, don't think, you know, don't, don't, don't think 21st century prison. This is, a, this is a Roman Empire prison. This is dangerous, and it's 
it's uh, clearly accounted in history that they didn't provide for the needs of their prisoners. That was up to the prisoners' friends to come and meet their basic needs like food and clothing. So when you read that they have compassion on those in prison, it was them coming and keeping their Christian brothers and sisters alive in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Their stuff was stolen. Houses ransacked. Wealth just taken away and gone. Why? Because they had decided to follow Jesus. This sounds frightening. It sounds intense. This is a great challenge. But look at how they faced it. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. When they had people come into their house and take out a bunch of their stuff, they had joy. This is amazing. How would you feel if if you became a follower of Jesus the very next day? Somebody shows up at your house and they're like, you stand over there, we're going to take everything. What does it look like to have great joy in a moment like that? It's amazing, but there's something going on. The great faith in action in the lives of these people that gave them what they needed to have joy in the midst of this. And here's the answer. Great faith gives us endurance. We read it up in verse 32. Recall the former days after you were enlightened when you endured a hard struggle with suffering. Their faith in action gave them the endurance that they needed. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, you can endure by being really bummed out, but you can hold on for dear life. But they endured joyfully because their endurance meant that, meant that they were going to get a reward. Did you see that? Verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. They knew that if they endured, that if they held to the faith, if they kept following Jesus, what God had for them was so much better, so much better than the trouble that they were facing. And notice their faith in action in the second part of verse 34. You accepted the plundering of your property since you knew since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. When they were going through this hard struggle with trials, they had the perspective that I might be suffering right now, but what God has for me in this is so, so, so much better. Now, you and I, I don't know, maybe you have family for whom this is an experience, but when you read this, you kind of ask, well, what do I have in common with these people? I haven't been arrested for being associated with Jesus recently. Probably won't be in this part of the world in my lifetime. And you might ask, well, what if I don't need to endure challenges like that? Well, the point is not to celebrate suffering. The point is that you need endurance to do God's will. Did, did you notice that in verse 36? The author says, you need endurance. Here's why. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. What you need to have in focus in your mind is that the endurance is in order to do the will of God, not simply to get through struggles. So the reason that we need endurance is because in doing the will of God, sometimes it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt real bad. And it's going to affect our money. It's going to affect our reputation, and it's not going to be light and easy. And I just, told, I, I just told you, like, I may not have gone to prison this past week, just like you haven't, but maybe you resonate with what I described to you with what my family is going through, spiritual forces of evil coming against your family. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe it's the frightening nature of being a Christian on your campus here in town. I mean, if people found out in your class that you're one of those Jesus people, what would they think? How would they view you? What would they call you behind your back? So we might not face the same kind of challenge that the Hebrews were facing, but make no mistake about it, we face really, really 
great challenges. But if we activate our faith, if we know that we know that we know that what God has waiting for us in the midst of difficulty is so much better and is so worth the suffering, we will have the necessary endurance to get there. Now, do you really believe that? I think here's a good gut check moment. Sometimes in my life, I have, like these Hebrew believers, I have known that more than at other times. I've had an experience of being assured that even if I experience difficulty here and now, what God has for me is so worth it. So worth it. Do you have that right now? Ask yourself. Do you have that gut check? If you were to go to school tomorrow and share the good news of Jesus with somebody and they react badly, how might it shake your confidence? Now, when we talk about doing God's will, in this passage, we see at least two things that that means. Like we said, we need endurance in order to do God's will even when it hurts. So doing God's will in context, two things at least. It means a willingness and a boldness to tell the Jesus story, to share the gospel. Why are the Hebrew believers being imprisoned, not because they're keeping it secret, but because they're telling their friends about it, and other people are informing on them, and they're being arrested. So clearly, doing God's will involves a willingness to tell the Jesus story. And man, no matter who you are, I've never met anybody who, in getting ready to share the good news of the gospel with a friend or a family a member or a co-worker is feeling just light and airy about it. It's a challenge. Palms are sweating. Heart is beating out of your chest. Like even in sharing the good news, there's a challenge in there that we need endurance for. But we, we must be willing to do that because that is part of God's will. Now maybe you're sitting in here and you say, I'm just going to rather subscribe to a personal faith and I have no interest in sharing the Jesus story with other people. In a kind way, let me push back, okay? If you think that way about the good news of Jesus, the good news of Jesus probably hasn't hit you deep enough. We tell people about the restaurants we love, the movies we see that we enjoy. When the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for you rocks your world, you can't help but tell other people. Yeah, it's nerve-wracking, but it's in you, like it's bubbling up. And you look for opportunities to tell other people. Probably hasn't hit you deep enough, but maybe there's just an unwillingness that you believe that you can be a Christian and not share the Jesus story. And you're maybe in here checking Aletheia Church out. Let me save you some time. If that's your stance, this is not the church for you. This will be an incredibly uncomfortable place because we are committed to be a people who make disciples. And that begins with sharing the Jesus story. How do you become a disciple when you hear the Jesus story and you believe it? How are other people going to become disciples when the Jesus story is shared with them and they believe it? So I don't mean to be mean, but please, like, let me save you some time. This is not the place for you because time and time again, Sunday after Sunday, we are going to learn what it looks like to boldly share the Jesus story. So if you're willing to do that, it's going to be a challenge. Not only that, but pursuing God's will also means living sacrificially. Look at verse 34. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. It affected the Hebrew believers in their wallets to serve Jesus and to live sacrificially to meet the need of others. If you are going to follow Jesus, it is going to require sacrifice. Because you're welcomed into a family of fellow Jesus followers who face challenges. And you might say, well, God is going to help you out. Hey, God may have sent you to help that person out with what's in your wallet. So if you commit to following Jesus, at any point, you have to be open to to Jesus tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, you see that person's need? I've put you here to meet it. And if that freaks you out because of of the loss of control, yeah, that's why we need great faith. We need to know that we know that we know that in following Jesus, God has great things waiting for us. Now, what do you do if you find yourself in a place 
where your faith has been shaken? What do you do if you find yourself in a place where your faith feels weakened? It's interesting. We, we think that those who have been in the game longest, like those who have been Christians the longest, are the least susceptible to dangers. But this shows us that that's clearly not the case. In fact, it's those who have been in the game a while who face the challenge of their, of their faith being shaken. So the question is, how do you strengthen your faith when your confidence is shaken? In a word, remember. That's what the author tells these believers to do. Remember. In verse 32, recall. Recall. And he tells us to remember four things. Here's the first one. Remember your times of great faith. He tells these people, he says, cast your minds back to a time when you were on fire for Jesus and even the plundering of your property and being thrown into prison and being publicly shamed couldn't move you. Maybe in your story, you, you can point your mind back to a time when that was the case. And what you need to do in the times where your faith feels weakened and challenges shake your confidence, cast your mind back to times when you faced similar challenges and God came through and did amazing things for you and through you, both in your life and in the lives of other people. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking back to a, a high school friend. It was the first time that I felt like really on fire for Jesus. And I was telling everybody and their mama about the Jesus story. And one of my friends who was of a different faith, I remember us sitting outside of his apartment well, his parents' apartment. We were only 18 at the time. Um, and I, was, I shared the Jesus story with him. And he said to me, if you bring up Jesus again in conversation, you are no longer my friend. But you know, I was so passionate about Jesus that I left that conversation like, whew, that's intense, but here we go. On to the next thing. And he distanced himself from me. But you know what? I don't regret it in the least. When you cast your mind back to those times, you get perspective what it looks like to live out great faith. Remember your times of great faith. Secondly, remember your reward. In verse 35 and 36, it's very clear. Don't throw away your confidence. It has a great reward. So that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Now, we don't have time to do a full survey of what he means by reward, but let me give you it in Paul's words. One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 through 18. This light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Jesus Christ came that you might have life and have it to the full and have it forever. You need to remember that. Third, remember your Savior in verse 37, to bolster the Hebrews' faith, here's what the author says. Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. He's talking about Jesus. And I'm not sure if you knew this or not, that Jesus came one time to deal with sin. Through his life and his death and his resurrection, he provided forgiveness for sin and entrance back into relationship with God. But the scriptures tell us that he promises to come again to fully and finally deal the death blow to sin and to God's enemies, and he is going to turn the tide. Do, do you know why you face great challenges in following Jesus? Because for millennia, human after human after human have sought after things that are not God's purposes. And it's created a wake and a tide that is antithetical to what God wants. And that is the tide of culture in which you swim. And when you choose to follow Jesus, you are turning upstream. And that means difficulty. But there is a day coming when the risen Jesus will appear again to fully and finally deal with sin. And he will vindicate his saints. Whatever we have lost in following Jesus, he will replenish a hundredfold. Whatever we have sacrificed, he will redeem in in. At the very end of the Bible, in Revelation, we're told that he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. When you go through the pain of challenges and you cry those tears, Jesus promises to bring you such extraordinary joy that it will 
Wipe those tears completely away. Remember your Savior. He is coming to vindicate you. And finally, remember who you are. Verse 39, we are not of those who shrink back, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Listen to me. If you've decided to follow Jesus, you serve a Savior who faced challenges like you and I will never have to face, and he triumphed. We are people whose namesake triumphed in victory over death itself. We are part of a heritage of church history where people have been killed for their faith while singing hymns of praise to God and preaching the gospel because they knew that they had a better possession. Remember who you are. I know sometimes we forget in the comfort of a place in which we aren't thrown into jail and in which we aren't publicly shamed, but don't forget these challenges you're, face, you're, you're facing for following Jesus mean you're a part of a people who will be vindicated by Christ and who have a great reward. Don't lose confidence. Don't shrink back. Trust God to give you great faith to face great challenges. Now, I don't know where this lands for you. I know where it lands for me. Goodness, this was ministering to me this week. I don't know where this lands for you. But here in this moment, before we get ready to celebrate people who've been saved by Christ, I want us to take a moment to pray. Maybe you are on fire for Jesus right now. Nothing can stop you. Maybe you find yourself in a place where things have waned and things have kind of deteriorated. And if you're honest, you are in the face of a challenge that has rocked you and shaken your confidence. Let's pray for God to strengthen our faith as we remember our Savior. Bow your heads and join with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these incredible words, these words of hope, these words of promise, these words of encouragement. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room who are facing great challenges. Would you assure them so that they can know that they know that they know that you are with them and that you have strengthened them, that you have, give them your, that you have given them your Holy Spirit to help them. And God, would you give us all a vision of what we have been promised by you. God, may we be a people who don't shrink back. May we be a people who face the challenges of following you with boldness and with fire year after year after year after year that we might be witnesses to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give us great faith, even this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.